today we're going to talk about predicate calculus. Uh, before we do, I want to uh, make a couple of notes. The first one is um, that you have a lot of new uh, peer tutors in this class and in the other class that are available for help, and they've posted hours on your um, calendar, which is at the top of the um, Moodle page and also on your uh, Piazza page. We have a post for that. And I just want to note uh, for the peer tutors, um, please make a big sign, like maybe a plastic cup and write 226 really big on it, or have a piece of paper next to you that says CSC 226 peer tutor or something. So when you're hanging out uh, to help people, then they can actually figure out who you are. Because I've had some people go for office hours and they can't find who it is that's doing them. So if you're a peer tutor, make it obvious that you're a peer tutor. If you make a t-shirt, you know, give us all the links so we can all buy them. Okay, if you want to be a peer tutor and you're not already, uh, make a private post on Piazza. So please, uh, some of you have been emailing me, please don't use email. I check Piazza more than I check email. So post it there. And anything you want to tell me, actually post it for the entire instructors group. Um, unless you're telling me my zipper was unzipped, the TAs are going to help me with it. Um, so uh, don't make it just for me. Make it for the TAs so you'll get the fastest possible response. Um, and so the way to do that is when you do your post, at the top it has three options for how many people can view. And the f default option is everyone. Then there's group. And as soon as you click group, it has you'll only see one or two groups on there. Uh, instructors is the first one that comes up. And the last one is individuals, and then you can pick a person. So it's actually faster to post to instructors, so do that. So I wanted to mention the answers to a couple of questions on Piazza's or address a couple of things that people have brought up on Piazza. And um, I know that some people aren't really happy uh, doing the labs. So I thought I would help um, with you. So uh, I mentioned this in class before, but I'm going to mention it again, that on Justified Thought, it is a program that is seeing if you can match patterns. And as I've mentioned in class, you have to pay attention and match them exactly because it's going to give you more problems if you don't. So pay attention. So here's an example. If you're given W implies W or A, that's the addition rule. Both these versions right here are both the addition rule. So they say if I know something, I can or something else with it. But this one says I can or it on the right. And this one says, I can or it on the left. Right? Because the square is what I start out with. The new thing is the triangle. So the top one says, I can or the new thing on the right. The bottom one says, I can or the new thing on the left. That's what that says. So you have to check the right one. And if you don't, it will give you more problems, just exactly like this. Okay, so what you need to do is when you're trying to match these, match up your variable with one of the shapes and then plug it in and see what happens. So if I do that, if I match the W and the shape, I can actually draw the shape around the W and then I can see that what I ordered on there was on the right. So it must match the one with the triangle on the right. Okay, so be careful with that. It's not hard if you pay attention. If you don't pay attention, you get more problems. Okay. So on Deep Thought, um, several of you have asked questions about addition. Um, like I told you, if you're having trouble with a problem on Deep Thought, like you need a variable that isn't even on the page, you need to use addition. Um, here's an example. Let's say you have F that you already know, and you already know F or G implies H. You can't put those things together without a whole bunch of rigmarole. So how can we make that easy? We can use addition to actually say that F implies F or G, right? How do we do it? Well, I click on F, and then I click on the addition button, and then it's going to ask me, what do I want to add? The thing that you have to do is just type G. So just tell the thing that you want to come after the OR. So the, what the addition button will do, it'll put the OR, and it'll put whatever you type in the box. So don't type F or G, because then you'll get F or F or G. Um, and don't type or G, because then you'll get F or or G and probably an error. Okay? Um, and both of those questions were answered on Piazza. So one thing that's happening is 
that um, not everybody is looking for whether somebody has had the same problem or not. So actually look and see if someone else has posted on the same question that you have a question about. One thing for deep thought is um, it actually randomly generates which letters it's going to use for, which, for the problem it gives you. So you might actually see that someone made a post and you're like, oh, that doesn't look like the problem I worked, even though they said it the same, it's the same problem number. That's because it will give them different letters. So it is actually the same problem, just have diff different letters on it. And if you need more practice problems with proofs, if you just change the letters, it, I promise you, your brain won't realize that it's the same. Okay? Um, so make sure that you do look for, if someone has a question already on the problem that you're having trouble, and post a follow-up there. That means that when someone else has trouble, they'll find it all in one spot. So try to do that so we keep it less, uh, less of a mess and more easy for you guys to get help from each other. But thank you all for being on there and for giving each other feedback. You're so fast, like faster than me most of the time. I'm like, oh, man, I missed. I wanted to get that one. So, um, And some of your TAs are having a lot of fun trying to keep the, you know, beat each other with the response time. So um, thanks for, for being on there. If you haven't logged into Piazza and you don't know what I'm talking about, then you're missing out on everybody basically asking each other questions and telling each other how to do things. So you should get on there because um, you're missing out. Okay, uh, one other issue is that, um, so there was a post this morning that was like, lab one and two, and the post said, this sucks. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, doing homework sucks. Um, and, and I'm actually very fine with your feedback on, on Piazza. It does suck, actually, to have to match things exactly. That's why we make computers to do these things for us, okay? But... Um, I've been giving you hints on how to do these. There's lots of hints on Piazza on how to do uh, the problems. And um, so anytime you have some feedback about the class, feel free to post it. You don't even have to make it anonymous because I don't read the names of anybody on Piazza unless I'm impressed with an answer that you give. So um, anyway, do always give me feedback about the class. I'll try to make it better. Um, I did ask for concrete feedback on Labs 1 and 2, and one of you nicely did that and said, hey, um, you know, certificate number entering is a pain in the butt. Okay, my answer to that is you don't have to enter the certificates. Okay, all of our lab data is on external logs, and we go straight to the log files. Okay, the certificates is a backup, so you can also back it up by just taking a screenshot of your finished problem, save that on your computer, and then if for some reason I don't give you credit for doing the lab, you can say, here's my screenshot. But you just keep it. You don't have to turn it in. Like, Here's the problem, though. You, don't, you can't see your grade on WebAssign until we upload it, and we're not going to do that until next week. Now, there's, there's a bonus to that. One bonus is the data log files keep track of what you're doing, so you don't have to. The, the detraction is that you can't see that it kept track of it, right? Until we upload it, you can't see that. That's why if you want to take a, a screenshot, you'll actually know that you have it and you can back it up if we don't give you the credit, which I have never actually had somebody do something and we weren't able to give them the credit. But, you know, for your own safety, if you want to do that, that will be great. Um, the other thing I was going to mention was I forgot. So I'll see if I remember it later. Okay, so you don't actually have to enter the certificates. That was just um, when I first got those tutorials, that's what the other instructor does, but I actually go straight to the log files. So I don't care if you enter them. Yes. Yes. Yeah, we still have it, even though you're logging on to the guest class. And if for some reason we don't have it, um, you know, I just will drop that lab. So if the logs mess up, I'll drop the lab. Yes. You don't have to put anything in WebAssign at all. What would you say? Yeah, the, the WebAssign is just a link to get to it. Same thing for all of the labs. So whatever it says, like actually none of the rest of the labs ask for certificates or anything. So you just do the labs and I'll check them. Please, 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 please don't post and say, can you check and see if it has my data? Okay, I'm going to do it right before the test. And, um, you know, if there has been a problem with yours, I'm going to be very reasonable, I promise. Yes. Three. 
Oh, it means you need to do all of them. Don't do all seven. Just do problems one through five. So just do the ones it asks. That's like as if I was giving you problems in your textbook and I said do problem three, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, most likely not. Um, so no, don't do a different problem than what we ask you to do because I'm only going to check and see if you did one, two, three, four, and five. Okay, so what I do is I write a program that takes the log file that I get and it checks for one, two, three, four, and five and sees if you does them or not. Any other questions? Uh, we did have a bug this morning on uh, lab three and I fixed it, I believe. So if you are logging in, if you're able to log in, that bug is fixed because it was a login bug. So um, if you find any, post them. I will get to them as quickly as I can. Okay, you'll be happy to know that the uh, lab three actually is less, way less picky than deep thought. So, but you have to type a lot more stuff. So there's pluses and minuses. Okay, so today we're going to talk about predicate calculus. And that means the first thing we have to do is talk about what a predicate is. Um, actually, I wanted to show you a couple of things on the Moodle before we get to that topic. So I apologize. We're going to switch over to uh, PC and take a look at our Moodle. Okay, so here's your Moodle class, which you probably never go to. Um, but there's a couple of reasons to go here. And the main reason is that um, there are packets on here, which are handouts about the current topic. And uh, there's some extra worked examples. So for example, where is it? OK, so for example, packet two actually has notes on it. So I just wanted to pull it up to show you that what I'm talking about today, if you have been looking at the packets, you'll see actually I'm talking about what's on there. So today we're going to do, we did adders uh, last week. We're doing predicates. We're going to talk about all these things. And the examples I'm going to do are on these pages. Wow, that looks terrible. OK, got to be bigger. OK, so the examples we're going to do are all in packet two. So if you've got a computer, you can open it up now. Um, so it's sort of shorthand for the notes that I'm doing in lecture. Um, so you can take a look at those, and I recommend it. Um, also, at the end of packet two, there is a test review. So, um, so this is page 12. So the um, sorry, packet two does have test review. So these are some sample proof problems, and then it has them worked. So it has solutions for that um, in there. So, uh, so you, and there's a few more problems, a few different problems for you to practice along with solutions. OK, so that's that. Um, and then also what we have is your test. If you click on the link to the test, there's actually a link to a few things you can do to review for the test. And this one, I've already downloaded into test one review. So this is our sample for what your test is going to look like. So if you practice this and you time yourself, you should be just fine for taking the test in the class. So it's going to be exactly formatted like this. It will have uh, nine problems on it. Um, each of them is the amount of points it says on here. So you have to do a truth table. You have to do a, a a proof by contradiction, a direct proof, a circuit problem, just like the multiplexer problem that we did. Uh, draw those circuits that you make. Apply to Morgan's. We're going to learn about this today. And uh, do a truth table with the predicate calculus, which we're going to start today. And then you have to translate some predicate calculus into English and vice versa, English into predicate calculus. That's the whole test. Your test will look exactly like that, but it will have different letters and different numbers and things on there. So if you practice that one, it's great practice for your actual test in here. Um, we have two study sessions planned for next week. And we've posted those on Piazza. So I believe Tuesday at 7 o'clock. So let's see.
There it is. So, so we've made a poll on Piazza. Um, that's not the one. These are my things that I, this is for my TA. There it is. Okay, so uh, Tuesday from 7 to 8.30 and Wednesday from 5 to 6.30. So students from both class will be, classes will be invited to those. Um, we've just made this a poll so you can let us know if you're planning to come to one of those times so that we can get in a big enough room for however many people show up. I will actually work over the practice test on Tuesday in class, um, but you'll have extra time to work with your TAs uh, to do problems together uh, and get help on Tuesday. You can also go to office hours. There's like a bazillion office hours, so uh, please do that. Um, but we've planned these two times, an hour and a half each, so you can, uh, you can go to those specifically to work on the test with other people. Um, so the, you don't have to do this poll. It's just for us to know how many people will come and try to get a big enough room. The only other thing I wanted to mention is that we, um, on both your Moodle and your Piazza, we've linked to the office hours. So right now, this is the current like weekly schedule for office hours. There are a lot of them. Um, and uh, when your peer tutors post when they're going to do hours, there'll probably be some more. So if you're a peer tutor, we'd like, if you can see, there could be some weekend office hours if anybody feels like doing them on the weekend. Um, and you can specify where you're holding them and that sort of thing. So just make sure you do that if you post office hours on the calendar. Any questions? Okay, so we'll go back and talk about uh, predicate calculus. All right, um, so a predicate, uh, we mentioned before that we can't, a statement that actually depends on some other values can't be a proposition. We can turn it into a proposition if we notate it like a predicate and if we give a value to an input variable. So a predicate is a function that becomes a proposition um, whose output depends on an input variable. So, um, so for example, I have P of X where, um, X comes from some person in class. That would be my universe of discourse, so that's where I'm pulling my variable from. And P of X can be equal something like X drives a Porsche, and I'm trying to have the letter match with something in the sentence so I can remember it. Kind of like when we write programs, we like to have the variables actually have names that we can associate with things. Um, so when we read them later, we'll know what they are. Um, but right now, P of X is not a proposition, right? because X is not an actual person. X is a placeholder for a person. So until I actually do what's called binding that variable to a value, P of X is not a proposition. It is a function whose output is true or false. So once I actually know what the input is, it can be a proposition, right? So P of Dr. Barnes can be a proposition, right? I'm, I'm a person in this class. I don't drive a Porsche, so P of Dr. Barnes is zero. Um, probably nobody in here does. Does anybody drive a Porsche? Even a borrowed one? That would be cool. Um, anyway, <laughs> okay, so we actually know that no one in the class drives a Porsche, right? Is, that, is the statement that no one in the class drives a Porsche, is that a proposition? Does it? Is it true or false? Yes, it is. No one drives a Porsche is a proposition. So even though X drives a Porsche is not a proposition, I can actually make some propositions with it. So if I talk about how many times a predicate is true or false, I can actually make that statement about how many times it's true or false actually can be a proposition. And we're going to show you how to do that. Um, but just to be more specific about predicates, we're going to do a little bit more. But uh, like I said, our our propositions, our predicates don't become propositions until we bind them to particular values for the inputs. Okay, so we're going to look at a couple of examples just from regular math. So here's our first example. And like I said, this example is given to you in your packet also. So let's consider the idea that P of X is equal to the statement x squared is greater than x. And that scribbling on the right, um, this x and the weird looking e and the r, means x is in, so this is a membership 
symbol. And this means the real numbers. And real numbers are regular numbers. They're basically not imaginary ones. So any decimal number or that you can think of, that's what that is. Okay, so we want to know, is x squared greater than x true for all real numbers? Or is it true for any particular one? So p of 0 actually says what I do is I take that 0 and I put it in for x. And then I have a statement that I can evaluate whether it's true or false, right? So is that true or false? Great, that's false. So p of 1 is going to be 1 squared greater than 1. Is that true or false? False. Two squared greater than two? True. Okay, so we've actually found out that this is sometimes false and sometimes true, right? So I actually have two different ways to write that. So this uh, letter right here means there exists. So the way I read this is there exists an x so that p of x is true. And I can plug in, so I can say there exists an x so that x squared greater than x is true. So since p of x is equal to that, I can substitute in, just like I do in my logic stuff. So if two things are equal, I can substitute one for the other. So is this a weird sentence to say in English? Okay, so any answer is correct there. It is weird for regular people to say when you're standing in the hall talking to them, right? So, but it's not weird in a math class, okay? It's not weird in a math class because you've probably seen your professors write these and they probably didn't even bother telling you what it was, <laughs> okay? Um, so you see them in math. It is a weird way to talk in English. What we normally say in English is we we'll use the word sum or A. So we have articles that we use for that. So I could say, I know a guy who has a car. Right? That's normal, regular English. But I'm saying the same thing, right? There's a guy that I know that has a car. There exists a guy that Dr. Barnes knows that has a car. Right? So I, I we have shorthand and we have things that we assume about how people talk, but if I hear A, or I hear some, both of them mean there exists, or a few. A, some, or a few, or any. All of those are words that actually mean there exists. So if you hear any of those, then you actually know that if I had to start translating this into predicate calculus, I can actually do it because there exists actually covers almost everything that anybody says. Or the opposite of it covers almost anything that someone would say, right? So earlier in class, we, we figured out that no one drives a Porsche, right? Okay, so can I write that statement with our new quantifier? This is called a quantifier. Can you write the statement, no one drives a Porsche with that? There does not exist a person, X, so that X drives a Porsche, right? So where do I put the not? Before or after the quantifier? Great, it comes before. Okay, so this is, for our previous statement, that is, no one drives a Porsche. For our prior value, sorry, of P of X. So I'm glad you guys figured that out. So we're, you, you got to be really careful what knots are. If the not were actually in front of the p of x, what would the sentence be? There is a person who doesn't drive a Porsche. That's obviously true, right?
So how would I write it in regular English? Well, let's write it in math. There exists a person who does not drive a Porsche. Okay, that's weird, and that would only be on Big Bang Theory, right? Well, that was a delayed reaction, okay. Okay, so there exists a person who does not drive a Porsche. Now, if you were talking with people, you'd probably say, not everybody drives a Porsche, right? That's much more likely for you to say. Like you're talking to somebody, blah, 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 blah. You're like, not everybody drives a Porsche. You would totally hear that, right? Okay, so these two things are equal. But they don't look like they're equal, do they? But there's a knot in there. And remember that tricky knots make things into lies, right? So the opposite of there is a person is not every person. So the opposite of there is is not every. Or not any. So there is a person um, who does not drive. So if I have, there exists in the not, then that's the same as not everyone. So we're going to look at that some more later. So I just want to introduce that into your brain. And then we're going to do some other math ones. And then we'll come back to the English. Okay, here's another example. So my statement, P of X, my predicate is going to be that X exclusive or X is equal to X. And x is going to come from 0, 1. So it's going to be a regular propositional variable like we have been. So we've had things that are 0 and 1. So this is how I write um, x is a Boolean variable or a proposition. So how about p of 0? So what we do with that is we say 0 exclusive or 0 equals 0, and we're actually checking it because we don't know. This is a statement. We're plugging in a value, and we're going to see if it is true or false. So what is 0 exclusive or 0? It is 0, so this is actually true. So let's try P of 1. So we get 1 exclusive or 1, and we're going to check to see if it's equal to 1 or not because what we're doing is we're actually plugging in the 1 everywhere we see an x. So part of the process that I'm going to do when I check predicate values is actually to just copy my variable input value into everywhere I see that variable. Do not use your brain for that part. Just copy. Because if you start using your brain too soon, you'll mess up. So get it copied in there and then evaluate the statement. So separate the putting the values in from evaluating the statement. Right? So this is false, right? Because 1 exclusive or 1 is 0, and 0 does not equal 1. So again, we have another function that is sometimes true, sometimes false. So we actually do have a variable x that makes p of x true. The variable that makes it true is x equals 0, right? So this is a true statement. And it's also true that there exists an x that makes p of x false, right? So this statement is true also, and the variable va value that does that, the x that does it, is actually 1. Any questions so far? So I have a question for you. Is With this particular P, is this P of X always true, no matter what X is? No, clearly not, because we just found one that's false, right? So we have another quantifier that is called for all, and it's written like an upside down A.
And this statement says, for all x, p of x is true. That's what it actually, that's how I read it. For all x, p of x is true. Sorry. Remove that up there. And this statement's actually false in this case. So this particular p of x, where x exclusive or x is equal to x, uh, for all x, p of x is false. OK, we can have also some more complex predicates that have more than one input variable. So for example, I can have a function that has two variables. So I've given you an x value and a y value. So I'd like you to plug those in and just write down the statement that results from q3, 2. So x equals 3, y equals 2. I want you to copy it down into the statement that q stands for, x less than y and x squared less than y squared. And then I want you to tell me if it's true or false. Did everybody plug it in? Check it with your neighbor and see if you got the same thing. Okay, so we should have put down 3 less than 2 and 9 less than 4. This is clearly false, right? Okay, are there any values of x or y that would make this true? Which ones? 1 and 2. So let's do Q of 1, 2. Okay, that's good. That's true. So we know that it's not always true because we found one false, right? But we know it's sometimes true because we found one that was true. How did you find the one that was true? Yeah, you. Yeah. With your brain? Okay. So, but that was not very specific. How do other people use their brains to find them? What did you say? Not the teacher. Okay. How do you, how do you figure it out? Well, the, the truth of the matter is that we try stuff. Okay. We read it. We think about what does the statement mean and when could it possibly be true. If you have no idea, how do you start? Just try some numbers. What are good numbers to try? One, zero. Why are one and zero good numbers to try? All math is easier. That's why they're good numbers to try. And also, zero is often a boundary case that breaks things, right? So the next thing to try is a negative number, because that often also breaks things. So if you're looking at real numbers, that's what we're looking at here, not just binary. Try zero, one, and minus one. If we're looking at real numbers. Um, and then if, if those are all working, then start trying some large numbers and then start trying some like fractions. And then if it's true all the time, try to think about whether like all the examples you try and you still keep trying to stump the system, then think about whether you could actually claim that this was true all the time. How often do you think we run across statements that are true all the time? Very rarely, okay? Your, your math book is about the only place you're going to run across statements that are true all the time, okay? Because they've actually worked really hard to figure out which things are true all the time, and then they put them in a book so people can find them, okay? Because there's so many false things in the world, all right? So all your axioms, for example, for your proofs are things that are true all the time. And if you think about it, that's still, still relatively a short list of things that is true all the time. Okay, so... Um, most of the time, if we ask you something like, for all x, for all y, q of x, y, you don't have to use your brain like our lovely friend did. You can say, probably not. Okay? 
you can verify it if you have a good idea of which things make it false. Okay? We can use multiple quantifiers because we have to have a quantifier with every single variable in order to bind it to enough values so we can tell if the predicate becomes true or false. Okay, so Q of X, Y here actually is not bound to a variable, is it? No, but the quantifier, what a quantifier does is it counts how many. So quantifier comes from quantify. That means we're counting how many input values make the output value true. So for all, actually is like writing down a little and between all the possible values, all the possible input values. So if this were true, that means that every single x value in the entire universe of real numbers and every y value in the entire universe of y numbers makes Q of x, y true. So I'm, I don't even want to start to write out what that actually means. It's a big and statement. So let me give you an example of what big and statement it is. So if I have, um, for all x, p of x, and let's say p of x is one that we've already looked at, x squared greater than x, the universe of discourse we're looking at is the real numbers, so all the x's are in the real numbers. Um, what this actually means, this is shorthand for writing p of 0 and p of 1 and p of 2 all the way up to p of 100 and so on, and we end it with all the negative numbers and also all the real numbers in between all those. Right? Yes, so that's what for all means. It means no matter what. Now, if you'd like to write out that and, you're welcome to do it, but you'll never ever get done. Right? Because there's an infinite number of real numbers. So that's why we have shorthand for things like this. Okay, so let's find out. Is P of X true for all possible values of X? No, we already figured that out. So if the for all is false, it's super easy to know. So if we find what we call a counterexample, that's one false, right? That's one x that makes p of x false. So whenever you're, you know, speaking English and, you know, someone says, you know, everybody can afford $5 for this, and then you say, well, John can't afford $5 for this, then you've actually found a counterexample, right? And you've just proven that the for all is false. It only takes one counterexample to prove that a for all is false. If you want to prove that it's true, you either can make a truth table that listed all the possible input values, and you show that everything in the truth table is true, right? Except we can't do that with the real numbers, but we could do it with truth tables, right? So actually what we've been doing so far, whenever we prove like an axiom, we're actually showing that for all the values in the world, for our input variables, that a statement is going to be true. So we were doing that. We were proving some for alls. Um, you just didn't know it yet. So how do we know that a for all x, p of x would be true, for example? I'd have to do a mathematical proof that would show me that no matter how I change the values, based on some kind of you know, math that I'm allowed to do, then I could do it. So what I usually do is I break the world into cases. So for this case, I would break it up to, into negative numbers, right? Negative numbers are easy because if you square them, they're always bigger than the original, right? And then zero breaks it, right? And then all the numbers between zero and one also break it, right? Because if you square a fraction, you get a smaller number. So, but I could prove it's true for x is greater than one, right? So if I change my universe to real numbers larger than 1, this could be true all the time. So when I start trying to do the reasoning that would help me prove it, I can actually figure out which part of the universe might actually have this statement be true. And the way I would do it, by the way, for x greater than 1 is I would say we have the statement x squared greater than x. If x is bigger than 1, I can safely divide both sides by x without messing it up, right? So I'm going to divide both sides by x, and I get x greater than 1. Wow. Well, that's awesome. So this actually, for all x greater than 1, p of x is actually true. And I just proved it because 
basically I took my x's and multiplied both sides by x, and then I get x squared is greater than x. So uh, that's like what we'd have to do. We'd have to do a mathematical proof with some legal math to show that it was always true. Are we going to do that very much? No. We're going to um, look at, for a little while, we're just going to look at predicates and see how often they're true. We're not going to make you do huge proofs of them. Um, we're just going to try to figure out how to translate some English into predicate calculus and also figure out how we can combine predicate calculus statements. Okay, so just to recap what we've done so far, we've looked at um, predicate calculus. So predicate calculus helps us bind variables to statements so we can actually make predicates into propositions. And another way we do it is to look at these quantifiers. Um, the for all quantifier is called the universal quantifier. And the there exists quantifier is called the existential quantifier. So I put in quotes what I normally say when I read it out loud. And um, in the parentheses is like when someone refers to it without having written it down on a piece of paper. So if they say, oh, I'm going to use the universal quantifier, that's they mean the for all. And by the way, it is a pet peeve of mine for you to write uh, the same way of what you put in WebAssign. So in WebAssign, you're going to have to put a big A because you can't make upside down A's on your keyboard. But when you write it on your paper, please write regular A's, like regular for alls. Don't write capital A's, okay? And don't write E's for there exists because it's supposed to be backwards. Because that's what we use it for. Because we use regular letters to represent variables and we use backwards letters. We use these letters to represent the quantifiers. Remember that you're learning like 10 different languages in here. One of the languages is predicate calculus, and this is the way we write it. Thank you. Okay, so the quantifier is going to check over the universe of discourse to see how often a predicate is true. So we just talked about for all. And remember, for all is like an and across the entire uh, input space. So all the x values, I have to take p of 1, p of 2, p of 3, everything, and and it all together, and that has to be true in order to get a true. So for all is like and. And there exists is like what? It's like or across the input space. So there exists x, p of x, is actually going to look at all the possible values. And if any one of them is true, it'll be true. So for all, acts like and across all the inputs. And there exists is an or across all the inputs. And the inputs are whatever variable comes after this. It's often going to be x, but it could be d or l or pumpkins. It doesn't matter. We can use squares, triangles. Anything can be quantified because we're going to treat it like an abstract variable position holder. OK, let's do another example. OK, so this is one of the statements we looked at before. P of x is x exclusive or x is equal to x. We already looked at that statement before. And x is a proposition. Its value is either 0 or 1. And we want to figure out for all x, p of x. We figured out it was false. But in general, um, what we're going to do when we're looking at a proposition and we're looking at a quantifier for the proposition is we make a truth table. Um, for for all x, because then we should have all ones if if it for all x is true, right? So we can make x, and it's easy to do a truth table for uh, propositions because we only have two values for the input. Okay, so now I can um, make separate tables, and I can treat this equals just like I did the logical equivalence earlier when we did truth tables for that. So that's really what it what it means. Actually, since it's logic, we can do that. So x exclusive or x is going to give me 0 here. It's going to give me 1 there. I'm sorry, 1 exclusive or 1 gives me 0. And this is what gives me 0, 1. So that's true, and that's false. So this would have to be all 1s for, for all x, p of x to be true. So, but I can say there exists x, p of x, right? Because one of those values in the column is true. So when we talk about an and or an or for, an or for all, 
the for all is going to look across, and both of them are going to look across all the rows and see if the output value, if a for all is there, it's going to see if all the output values are one, and if a there exists is there, it's just going to see if any of them are one. So remember back to your first homework problem, you had to look at all the possible output values when you had two input values, right? All the possible output functions. So there was only one that satisfied for, for all x and y, it, it was true, right? And that was the tautology function, which was all ones. And there's only one where there exists x, p of x would have been false, p of x, y would have been false, right? And that's the all zero function, the contradiction function. So there exists x is almost always, there exists is almost always going to be true, and for all is almost always going to be false. So just thinking about the space of, of things, just the probability is that. So just remembering that, remember that ors are almost always ones and ands are almost always zeros. So both of those actually give you a little bit of insight about these quantifiers. Okay, how about if I ask you this? So what that is asking is, is there an x that makes p of x false? Yes. So whenever I am going to ask you for a truth value of this, this, is, this statement is true, and it's true when x equals 0. And this statement is true, and it's true when x equals 1. Okay, so we already decided that for all x, p of x is false. I'm putting brackets because you guys, um, you need them when we're going to put in equals because I'm not claiming anything about p of x. I'm claiming something about the statement for all x, p of x. Because if I just put in equals, it's going to go with whatever it's next to. So that would be that it would equal, p, I would be claiming that p of x equals zero. Okay. How about for all x not p of x? What is that asking me? That would mean that p of x is never true. So I can look at the truth table and say, well, this sometimes it's true, so this can't be. Can't be true. So how about not the quantity there exists x p of x? It's false because this one's true. So the not on the outside just negates this. So if this is true, the opposite is false. So these two things are opposites. They're attached because they are basically the same thing. One's the not of the other one. But notice that the second and last rows are not don't have the same truth value, right? They got the same letters. So you need to be careful about where the knots are. Okay, so if we have a knot next to the predicate, it's very different than having it next to the quantifier. Yes. What if you take the knot outside of the brackets? It's the same. So whenever the knot is right in front of the quantifier, it applies to everything that the quantifier applies to. So I'm going to ask you guys not to put brackets everywhere just because it's easier to read things with the fewest possible number of brackets. So you could write this like this. You can put as many brackets as you want. It'll still be equivalent. But um, I use the minimum number. So uh, a quantifier, by the way, always applies until you uh, have another one or you stop using the variables. OK, how about not the quantity for all x, p of x? That's the opposite of for all x, p of x, so that is true. Okay, so since we're dealing with ands and ors, we ought to have De Morgans, right? Ands and ors and nots. We do have De Morgans for this. 
So De Morgan's tells us that if we and two things together, and then we negate that and, we get not P or not Q, right? So if we get and the quantity P and, sorry, not the quantity P and Q, that's equal to not P or not Q. But remember that for all, XP of X is actually equal to like, let's say, if X's come from 0 and 1, that's P of 0 and P of 1. So if X is a proposition, then this is actually what, these are actually equal. For all X, P of X actually equals P of 0 and P of 1. So not the quantity for all X, P of X is the same as notting this, right? And then I could use regular de Morgan's with that. Regular de Morgan says that that's equal to not P of 0 or not P of 1, right? But we actually have a quantifier that's equal to ORs for over the entire input space. So this thing that's getting ORed together is not P of X. And there's a there exists because I have an OR. So the there exists is shorthand for OR between all of the things that come after it. And since this OR is between some not P's, then it's got to be there exists X not P of X. So we have just done a proof by example of De Morgan's between quantifiers. So I say proof by example because this doesn't prove everything, right? I've only proved it for domains where the X is a proposition. We're going to do later some proofs that are how you could prove this forever, but I'm just going to tell you that it's always true. So if I negate A for all, it's the same as changing the for all into a there exists and negating the inside. So what we've just proved, proven, or we've just shown, demonstrated, not actually proven, is that we can move the knots, but when we do, they flip the quantifier. And it's exactly like De Morgan's for our ands and ors. We can move our knots around, but they flip the variables and they flip the operators. So if I move a knot across an, a quantifier, by the way, they, none of the knots can't jump. When they go, they go through something. When they do, they flip it. Okay, so if I'm going to move this knot over here, I'm going to flip this quantifier to a there exists. And they don't disappear. Knots never disappear. So I can cancel them out with two of them, but they don't disappear. So if you are trying to um, get rid of knots, remember that you can't just get rid of them. You have to, they have to find each other and cancel each other out, like matter and antimatter. Okay, so likewise, I could do the same thing. I could negate both sides of this, right? And then I have another true statement. By the way, these are logically equivalent. So not not for all x. So that's for all x, p of x. This is like our secret life of gates, right? It's like secretly a for all is the opposite of a there exists with the insides negated. So what I mean by ins insides is the statement that follows the predicate that follows the quantifier and its variable. Okay, so this not applies to the entire statement because the there exists applies to the entire statement. So as I said before, the scope of the quantifier is until I have another one. So, or until I have an operator and then another quantifier. So that is De Morgan's for quantifiers. If I negate a statement that is quantified, I have to flip the quantifier and flip the value of the predicate inside. So that's actually why we had that there exists, you know, um, a person that doesn't drive a, cor a Porsche is the same as not everybody drives a Porsche. So let's go back to that. So we had there exists X not P of X. 
But if we want to move the knot to the outside, then we have to flip the quantifier. So this first one was, there's someone who does not drive a Porsche, right? And the second one is, not everyone drives a Porsche. The second one is easier for us to say in English. Because this is easy to say in English, right? And there's no knots in there. Everyone drives a Porsche is easy to say. And it's really easy to put a knot in front of that, right? So let's say I give you this statement. I would like you to distribute the knot with De Morgan's. Try that on your paper. No, that's just, now we're on a new problem. Sorry. Um, so the question is, are there normally parentheses around the Q of X and the P of X and Q of X? No. As I've been saying, please don't write any extra parentheses you don't need. So the there exists X applies until, because we don't have any other quantifiers, it applies on the whole statement. It's just like when you write a program and you say int X, and I can use X forever until I go to another scope. Okay? So doing a there exists x on the paper is very much like saying x equals 1 in a program. It's like picking out a value for x that will make your statement true. It's just that we don't have to specify which one it is. We're just saying that there is one. We don't know which one it is. It's like somebody in this room did something bad. I'm not going to say who it is. Okay, that's what there exists x is for. Okay, so I want you to check with your neighbor about whether they got the same thing when they distributed the knot. Uh, and use the Morgans on this. Okay, so we're just going to try to make an equivalent statement that has a not first. So while you're working on that, I'll write the answer to the other one, which I hope everybody got. Okay, I'll, I'll give you a hint. The easiest thing to do here is actually to go ahead and put your knot outside. And then what do you do? Apply one of the knots to the inside. I can, I can double negate anything I want, anytime I want. All the time. Yes. Because I just put them there, because everything that's a proposition can always be double negated and it's still the same thing. And I wanted to have a knot in the front. So if I made a wish for putting a knot on the front, the only thing I'm allowed to do is to put two of them. No, that's not the answer, right? Well, I mean, actually, that technically is an answer, right? Technically, that is a statement that has a knot on the front. So that is a great point. So I didn't specify my problem good enough. I only want one on the front, though. So that means I want you to distribute the second one. So try that. OK, make sure you're checking with your neighbors, see if they got the same thing. I'm going to write what I get here. Don't do any of it in your head. 
So I distributed one knot across the quantifiers, and then I negate the inside. I didn't, I didn't do anything else yet. I've only distributed the knot across the two quantifiers. Yes. Yes, so the question is, is the not P of X and Q of XY, is that one piece? Yes. No, this is not a chunk that goes with that. Quantifiers apply. Basically, even if I don't draw them, this is what's always there. That's what I've been saying is the quantifiers apply to everything after them. Okay, so this is what we have next. So we're going to copy this stuff, copy, copy, copy. All right, then we're going to distribute this not using our propositional De Morgan's Law, right? Okay, so we get not, not P of X or not Q of XY. And then we can do double negation, right? And then we're pretty much done. So we get not, there exists X for all Y. P of X or not Q of X, Y. So we're just using De Morgan's. That's it. So it's as easy as it looks. You're just going to, we have some problems like that on the test where you have to take a statement and actually there will be a knot on the front and you have to distribute it. But this is the same, same thing. Okay, there's one last thing I wanted to do today, and that is to talk about um, a shorthand that we use for, for talking about variables. And this is just something we use in this class to do truth tables and write down what we know. So there exists X and for all X are uh, propositions and they are talking about how often something like P of X is true. So I'm going to use this shorthand to help me figure out truth values. So sometimes I have to look at P of X without a quantifier on the front of it. And I need to talk about how often it's true or false. So if I make the statement for all X, P of X, this, can, this is a proposition, right? It can be true or false. And I can make another proposition that's also true or false. And I can end them together because they're propositions and I can do whatever I want with propositions and operators. We've been doing that for a while. So I can actually make a truth table for this just like I normally would. Each one of those is propositions. I can use them as propositions. I can end them together and I get the same normal stuff. But if I start trying to understand like what this actually means, I need to be able to write down some shorthand that helps me understand it, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a column for P of X, and I'm going to make a column for Q of X, and then I'm going to talk about how frequently P of X is true and how frequently Q of X is true. So I know that in row one, remember that each row is like the state of the universe. In row one, I have that for all X, P of X is false. So that means that there's at least one counterexample. That means there's a P of X that's false, right? So I have at least one false. So the reason why we have the shorthand is because they actually correspond to the zeros and ones for our quantifiers. So if I have a for all and it is false, then I have at least one false for the function that's on the inside. No matter how complex it is, that for all means that Whatever that thing on the inside is, there's at least one false for it if for all x, p of x is false. And since this is a zero, it'll be exactly the same. Now, if I'm in 
the third row, which says for all x, p of x is true, then I actually know that p of x is always true. And I have the same thing for there. So here I have for q of x that for all x, q of x is false. And I can fill it out exactly the same way. So if I have a for all, if that is false, I get at least one false. If it's true, I have all trues. So what we might want to use this for is to look at something like for all x, p of x, and q of x. So first of all, we need to know what this actually means. So if I'm seeing if these two things are equal, I want to actually show that these are logically equivalent. Then I need to know how often p of x and q of x is. So what's the difference between what's on the left and what's on the right? What's the difference between for all x p of x and for all x q of x and for all x p of x and q of x? So let's translate into some English sentences. And let's make p of x, uh, x drives a Porsche, and q of x means that x is a quitter. OK? So if I say everyone drives a Porsche, if that's true, and everyone's a quitter, is it true that everyone is a person who drives a Porsche and is a quitter? Yes, it does. But what I've actually done is over here, I only have one variable. So when I'm talking about p of x right here, I have to be talking about the same person here. So p of x and q of x with the same quantifier actually means that these x's have to be the same all the time. And that means I'm talking about this force driving person as a quitter. OK? Over here, these Porsche people can be different than these quitter people, right? Because these are different quantifiers. So even though it's the same letter, this, these x's and those x's don't have anything to do with each other, but these do. Yes. Yes, uh, yes, you can. You can, but you can't over here. So um, over here, I have to, right? So these can be different domains. So the question was, can I use x's from different different universes? Yes, I can, uh, and I can or and and these together as any any way I want if they're separate. If they're not, then I have to somehow make the universe the same, right? So I'd have to restrict the universe on both sides to even talk about what this st statement means, OK? So what I do is I use this shorthand, assuming that my domain is the same on the left and the right. I'm going to use the shorthand to figure out how often this p of x and q of x is true. So if I and, so right here, I'm actually going to and the p of x with the q of x. So there's a way to do it, but it's not straightforward, right? Because these aren't actually propositions. So, but remember that ands preserve falses, OK? So if I and two of these frequency things together, I'm going to save the most falses that I can. So if I and at least one false with at least one false, how many falses do I have? At least one, right? So for this p of x and q of x, I'm going to have an at least one false. And the same thing's going to happen in every row except for what? The last one. I'm going to have. A, P of x is always true and q of x is always true. That means no matter what I plug in, I get a true. And a true and a with a true always gives me true. So I'm going to get an all true if I and those together. So we're going to talk about those some more next time. But just remember, now we're going to look at this quantifier and say, oh, that's at least one false. So for the for all quantifier, that gives me zeros. And for all true, it gives me a one. And we'll see you next time.